Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to today's webinar, Finding Talent in New and Hidden Places. I'm Josh Jones, and I'm joined by Mark Hamill, Sarah Goldberg, Emily Muckin, and Zoe Wren. Today's content is sponsored by our friends over at Gem, and we are joined by Zoe Wren, who joins us from their team. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Zoe. I'm so excited to be here today and to hear our great panelists, Sarah, Emily, and Mark, um, share how they rethink sourcing strategies and tap into the new and hidden go mines for quality talent. Um, GEM is proud to be sponsoring this webinar as we strive to be great partners with enterprise talent acquisition teams and empower them to engage their entire talent network and optimize sourcing efforts. Um, we have a quick intro video to GEM to show you and then we can dive into the discussion. If the video piques your interest and you would like to learn more about GEM, uh, please feel free to request a demo or contact us at sales at gem.com. Thank you, Josh. Zoe, for I apologize. This, oh. the, the video is not loading. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm getting a spinning wheel of not good vibes. Um, okay. Rather than delay on that, I'm going to try to load it. Maybe we can put it on, bolt it onto the end of this presentation. Um, this presentation is being recorded, everybody. So by the end of the day tomorrow, you will receive an, a link uh, with today's recorded content. We're also going to provide the slide deck. We've got a lot of information that we're going to cover. Uh, we've put together a really awesome slide deck that's got some links in there. So you won't be able to click the links during the live webinar, but you will once you have the deck in your hands. And we're going to cover some of those tools. And we also have a few promotions that are going to appear on the right hand side of your screen. So pay attention to those as well. And without any further ado, I'm going to pull up the slides and hand this over to Mark and we'll be off to the races. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Um, I, yeah, as you can see it all in the picture right there. Uh, my name is Mark Hamill, not Mark Hamill, but spelled Different, but I have shared the same name with the actor who played Luke Skywalker. I see lots of people in the chat uh, calling out Luke Skywalker, so I'm glad that people get this reference. I took, uh, several years ago, I took uh, Photoshop classes for this exact purpose, and as you can see, it's clearly money well spent. Um, but my uh, role currently, I'm with a, a small startup company uh, called Amazon. <laughs> I'm sure nobody's ever heard of that one. Uh, working on, I work for the uh, entertainment side of Amazon. So I do a lot with um, Prime Video and, and music and uh, a lot of new cutting edge stuff that's not really public yet. It's pretty cool, but I focus heavily on the top of the funnel, the sourcing side of it. Um, and as you can see, my information's right there. One quick little soapbox PSA. I want to call out that like the conversation does not stop at the end of this webinar. Like you have my contact info. You're all in talent acquisition. You can probably find me on LinkedIn. Actually, I think Josh is going to share that in a minute. Uh, my LinkedIn profile it is. Uh, please, like anything that we cover, if there's questions on it, like there's a lot of resources, which I'll touch on, on on some of these slides in a minute. If you have questions and want to know anything about that, like please reach out to me. Like the only way we grow as a community as a whole is really to leverage each other and ask questions. So that's my little soapbox moment. Uh, I think Sarah is the next. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, also in Chicago, I've been peeking through the chat and it seems like we are just like out in force today. So hello to everyone else from the Windy City. Um, I'm a sourcing manager at the New York Times. So I lead the team that does our tech product, product design and data sourcing. Um, really, really excited to be here today, catching up with you and uh, we have so much to share. Um, and, you know, plus one and co-signed to everything Mark just said, um, please feel free to connect continue the conversation after today um, and you know feel free to drop questions in the chat as we go I'm just so excited to be here and I will pass it off to Emily thank you all right um, so as you can see my name is Emily Muckin and I'm a senior technical recruiter at reddit I just joined about a month ago and here at reddit we actually do use gem and I like it so far so um, having said that, I may have connected with you on LinkedIn, because um, I'm even recognizing names in the chat, and um, just want to give a shout out to the folks who've joined today who are looking to network and um, maybe in the midst of uncertainty or layoffs. Um, that was also my situation, um, having been laid off from Netflix. So just giving a voice to everything that's going on in the recruiting world right now. and. 
um, wishing everybody who is looking for their next adventure lots of luck, since that was just me. All right, there. That's my intro. Awesome. I will. I will steal this back and steal the show for a couple minutes. Um, oh, I just uh, realized that those aren't playing. Um, those slides, which just shifted on me. Uh, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, uh, and so I use the Michael Scott uh, and Dwight Schrute uh, making fun of PowerPoint. Uh, when the, and it was classic when they asked Michael to make a PowerPoint, and he thought it was the his PowerPoint. Anyway, good stuff. Uh, the big point for today is, is we're talking about finding candidates in untapped hidden places. And I wanted to provide a little bit of data, just kind of like market data and, and run through that as why this is something we should all really be thinking about. And then follow up with a, a few, just like I have tons of resources that are on these slides that we all put together. I'm going to show a couple of them just real quickly, and then we'll kind of jump into some questions. But before all else happens, uh, at every event that I speak at, I always like to start with a joke, whether this is re a, a virtual event or not. We have what, like 1,500 roughly individuals. So you all deserve a joke to break the ice and start with. Um, and I was trying to think of something good. And I, I, I saw a spider that like crawled at my desk and it was just like limping along. And I was like, the poor little guy, like, where does he seek his medical advice? And then it dawned on me, it must be WebMD. You're welcome for that one. Um, so all of that aside, uh, talking about some of the market data. So I, I pulled some quick numbers that, again, I think paint the picture for why this is really important. First, the US population. It's roughly 329 million currently. And there's about uh, 185, I think that number is a little bit different at this moment in time that have a current profile on LinkedIn. Most folks usually use LinkedIn in some aspect in their recruiting workflow. I would say most all of us do. The number is actually like 89% of people use LinkedIn as their like primary source. Um, but if you take the 185 million current active profiles in the US and you figure that there's roughly 20% of the population I found are minors, you remove the 20% from the 185. And that means that roughly about 70% of the addressable population have a LinkedIn uh, profile, if you will. So if you think about it, 70% is a lot, but that also leaves about 30% of individuals which are not on LinkedIn in some capacity. And when also another, actually we'll pause there. The other stat I wanted to add is that I ran something internally with like ex Amazonians where I currently am. And there's about 30% that don't have active LinkedIn profiles from that are part of Gen Z. So two notes here. One, there's not as many people in the addressable market on LinkedIn as, as we think there should be. Secondly, there's kind of a cultural shift away from LinkedIn and, and being active on LinkedIn with profiles because like individuals are getting bombarded with messages or there's new platforms out there. And it's just, it's not as one strong as it used to be in my opinion and data kind of backs this up. Secondly, I do feel like there are so many people that get siloed to using LinkedIn solely that you have a pretty big addressable, addressable market that we're not tapping into. So that's the whole point of this webinar is to talk about areas that we can find candidates that aren't in the typical channels. Um, I also mentioned those last two notes, essentially, that 89% of people use LinkedIn mostly. Oh, but 82% um, was, according to, to Statista, 82% of people have some form of social media presence or social networking presence, if you will. So there's a big gap there between what's actually available and what LinkedIn's showing us. So the next slide is more around LinkedIn and the reliance that we all have on it. Currently, the industry average response rates, I, I don't think that this is quite accurate, but at least from the LinkedIn talent solutions that I found, it said 18% response rates. I've seen, depending on what you're looking for, if it's very tech heavy, it's a lot lower than that. Like I, I, I can tell you it's, it might be even in single digits for some people I've seen, um, but if it's other areas, it could change. So those numbers are out there. LinkedIn's probably not the best resource yet. We all use it, hence the purpose of this webinar again. Um, a couple of the really interesting stats that I threw on here on, on, for bullet points is that with that type of response rate of less than 20%, if you think about it, you have to reach out every 10 people you reach out to, only two of them are going to reply to you. And that's not saying that they're interested. Those are just replies. So let's say, uh, just getting lucky, that half of those reply to you with interest. That's one out of every 10. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's considered probably good if they're responding to you half the time with interest. So that's a challenge, and it shows that these overtapped resources are even becoming more of a challenge to find talent. Um, and it's not going to change with that final bullet point right there. You'll see uh, there's 1.6 
million computer science related jobs available. And current universities are producing just about 60,000 degrees awarded annually. So those numbers don't quite add up to making this any easier for us on the technical side. Um, yeah, uh, the other parts are, are just talking about like in-mail response rates and things like that, which I already went over a little bit. But the point, takeaway from the other two bullet points is that I think that 20, so the last one says that there's receiving over 20 emails per week. Uh, I would venture to say that that's probably low. I think it's a lot more than that. Um, but the point is if we're all fishing in the same pond and uh, it, it's a pond that's very overtapped, it's very tough to be, uh, get through the clutter. And again, the point of this webinar is to talk about how to get through that clutter. So those are a couple points I wanted to call out. And then how am I gonna do this? I'm gonna share, so I have four slides of resources um, and I will show you like four of my favorite ones. And as I mentioned very early when I first gave my little soapbox is that please reach out to me. Like these are all links. So you'll be able to click on them and play around with these resources on your own, but reach out to me at any point if you have questions, it's, it's all pretty straightforward stuff for the most part. Um, so I'll show a couple of those, but real quickly, when we talk about LinkedIn's 185 million US profiles, if you think about like GitHub, uh, if you're talking about technical talent you're looking for, there's 83 million. That's a lot. GitLab's 30 million. Slack is another great resource. There's 10 million active users daily. Discord has 140 million registered users. So these are other untapped areas that we should be looking into because the, the end theme, the result of, of what we're trying to do is meet candidates where they are. And this is where the candidates are, are kind of shifting to in, in today's world. So uh, I will... Let's do this. I will share my screen for just like maybe five, 10 minutes and show a couple of resources. And then, like I said, we have a bunch of like pre-submitted questions um, that we'll just start talking about as a group and, and solving the problems that way. So without further ado, let me click share my screen. We tested this, so I'm sure it's gonna work, right? Of course. Sarah, Emily, can you guys see this? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So I know we said, I love these webinars because you get so many requests this like, it's like Christmas morning. Um, why is this not loading? Of course it's not gonna load in the middle of the webinar. There we go. So I have a couple pre like just teed up things to show and all these links are on the slides. So don't freak out. Like don't need to write this down or take screenshots or whatnot. But one thing I wanted to call out is that a lot of us use LinkedIn as part of our workflow, which is tremendous. And essentially we all should have it as part of our recruiting workflow in my opinion. But how many times do we come across a profile that is just like Annabelle S or Sarah G or, you know, Emily M or Mark H. Like, what do we really do with that? Sometimes there might not even be a profile picture. So what do we go off of? Like, maybe this person calls out in their bio or their, their work experience that they're building deep learning networks at, at Meta or who knows what, but you don't really have like a last name or a first name to go off of. It's very simplistic, but it's something that I use in my workflow often is that in the URL, it, it usually always will display for the most part what their username is on LinkedIn and note that humans are creatures of habit and we use the same username very commonly across other platforms. I myself have the same username just about everywhere I go. So if you take their username up here and you plop it into, again, these resources are all there. I use what's my name uh, or, uh, a lot and it, you search for it. You can show all and it'll pop up all the places that this person uses their username. Um, again, GitHub's a great resource for this type of stuff. Same person, as you can see, it all just comes back to being humans being creatures of habit. And I'm not gonna go through all these, but each one of these, I have like a bunch of them that I link to that all check usernames um, and they all return very similar results, but I use them daily. Like a lot of this, it's fun to sit in these webinars and you see all these cool tools and you go back to your desk and you're like, oh gosh, I'm never gonna use that. Or I, I don't even remember what they just showed me. Like you leave with a jazz, but then you, you get to your desk and you're not doing it. This is stuff I actually use in my daily workflow. So I wanted to at least like call out like, hey, follow the username as Dean DeCosta says, follow the breadcrumbs. Like there's so many sites to cross-reference usernames. And that again, can get you what you need to know to find what you need about the candidate. So here's, there's like six of them. They're all on there. They're like free people search. I mean, this is pretty cool because if you take the username um, and use like the GitHub tool that you can just pull their username, their email address. Again, link is in the slide. You don't have to write this down, but humans are creatures of habit. The, here's their GitHub. I searched for their GitHub uh, username and GitHub is very easy to find email addresses. This runs that algorithm for you, finds the name. Why am I showing you this very quickly? Because free people search, you can like reverse email lookup. I haven't trusted this one, so fingers crossed it works. Uh, we just pop in the name. 
Windy Cromwell, nice. This one, well, it's the right location. Hmm, I'll just do mine. Maybe we'll have a better result if I show mine. Ah, there we go, Mark Portland. That's definitely not me, but that's the right address. Anyway, point is, if you're trying to see like more information about the person, where they live, like phone numbers even, there you go. I, I use what uh, that's them all the time. Uh, it's a free people lookup tool. Um, I won't go over that, those are all on the slides. Sherlock is an amazing search tool. Uh, you just have to be able to, you have to know a little bit of Python, but the point is it's very easy to install. Uh, the steps are right down there. I can show anybody how to install this, but you just run in the terminal, pop in the username, and it gives you all those sites right there. It's, again, another way to do this that is very quick and easy to find where usernames are, are reused. So that's something that I use all the time. Quickly, I will show a couple more. Uh, PimEyes is another one that I use. It's basically like, Tinai, where you look up um, uh, pictures or, or, or I guess profile photos. If we go back to this same individual of Annabelle, I've already saved the picture, I think. Hopefully I did, didn't I? Yes, sweet. Um, and you just load it into the tool and you let it work its magic and it will pull up for you everywhere that this person uses that photo as well as some uh, AI matching with their face shape and structure. And it shows all the different places that this person or what we, they, it believes is this person uses that profile picture or that picture. So again, it's gonna show you other places. It's likely a profile picture, meaning if like the GitHubs and the Twitters and things of that nature, which you found with like, what's my name? It showed you those, but here's a place where you can find the same picture too. So I use that quite commonly when I'm having trouble finding where people are or what other sites they might be on and finding the candidates where they are. Um, another great place that I look for candidates is on Twitter. Um, this is Annabelle. I just linked it up with Josh for Twangulate for a quick example. Um, you can find who's followed by both of them, who they're followers of. And why is this beneficial? Well, if you're looking for somebody that's maybe a research scientist, for example, and they're working on some sort of deep learning, you have one candidate that is, and somebody within your company is, you could see who they're connected with, and there might be a common thread there that you could leverage for your reach outs and your communication that way. So Twangulate, great resource. Um, two more, and then I'll be done. The first one of the two is Twinfoleek. I don't know if anybody uses this, uh, but it's very cool. You just simply plop in their username down here at the bottom, which I've already done, and it will send you to this site, which shows you a bunch of information on the user. But what's really beneficial about this is two things. One, it shows you how commonly they use either the web app or the mobile app. And that's something to think about because if you see a lot of logins from a mobile app, you might wanna think about your messaging strategy in that if they're gonna read it most likely on their mobile device, you're gonna want it to be short, concise, to the point, probably bullet points. Um, or if there's somebody that's commonly using the web app, you'll think that they might be using some sort of their normal type of email uh, platform where they might be able to easier read a, a longer message or something with live links. So just that helps you understand your audience a little better. And there's also geo, uh, well, I don't think this profile is gonna show me any geo, uh, but there's also, oh, better idea. It shows you locations as well, where they've logged in, um, which can be a little bit uh, interesting to follow. You might not need to follow that, but the point is there's beneficial information on Twinfoleek. Final one, and then I will get off my soapbox, is very similar. Uh, it's the follower wonk. It really shows you a lot of geography. And what's beneficial about this is you can see where their followers are or the people they're following are. And that's beneficial because if, again, you're looking for, let's use an example of some sort of research science that's involved in deep learning, and a lot of their followers are in Seattle, for example, you might be looking for roles in Seattle. You could dive into that network there and see who all those followers are and the Apple users doesn't fall too far from the tree. So uh, I've taken way more than enough of the stage uh, and I will get off of that and I will quit sharing my screen and I will close super quickly with the statement again of if anybody has any questions about those slides and the links, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help. Josh, all yours. I'm very excited about that deck that's going to be shared. Um, I know I went against your guidance and I was actually scribbling down a few things that I want to go back and take a closer look at, but that was awesome. Thank you for putting that together. Um, it sounds like you finished the internet. You've looked everywhere there is to look. So with that being said, 
where where's one of the most random, strangest, obscure places that you've found a candidate and actually made a hire? Yeah. Uh, that's what makes our job fun, I think, is that we get to innovate endlessly and there's no one right or, well, there probably are wrong ways to source, but there's no one right way to source. Uh, for me, I... I um, X ring into hacker rank has been beneficial because we use a lot of, um, you can't really actually, you can't really X ray into hacker rank anymore. I don't think point is, uh, we use a lot of assessments, uh, for companies I've been a part of that are very similar. So if they're scoring well on specific hacker rank, uh, I mean, they might have some challenges out there. If they score well on those, usually you want to reach out to the people that scored well, that's one. But I think the, 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 my favorite place at least to tout about a little bit is that I, uh, found an author for a deep learning book on Amazon books. Uh, and reached out to the author and moved it forward from there. And they, they work at Amazon now. So uh, that was definitely one of my, um, one of my favorites to talk about. So yeah, yeah. Lots of endless, endless answers for that, but I'll, I'll muddle it down to two. I think that's awesome. Emily, Sarah, and do you have any crazy places? I have a good one. Okay. So I'm going to start with one that is the most unusual, but then I'll go with the mo the second most unusual because I think it's more applicable. The very most unusual was I was sharing an Uber. It was a very busy day in Seattle. So I had to share an Uber ride. I was going to a chocolate festival and um, with Bedia. And I was so excited about the teams I was hiring for. I just told him about some of the roles we had open in a very conversational, no pressure way. He got excited about it, ended up interviewing and getting hired. So that was unusual. And I think does support the theory that you really don't ever know um, like who you're going to connect with or talk to. Um, but I think it's less likely and less effective to depend on in-person methods. So my second most was, and this is something you can take take to the bank or take back to your desk is um, I I do this judiciously, but I posted back when I, I don't have a Facebook anymore. Not that I know of, but you're welcome to do all the searches on me and see if it's still floating out there. Um, I used to have a Facebook page. I was hiring veterinarians and it turns out it's really hard to hire veterinarians. Um, so did that for a little while. And I, I kind of had reached a wall in my own search and I posted about what I was doing for work and what I was hiring for on my own personal Facebook page. And it turns out I have like a third cousin who's a veterinarian that I'd never met, but that's the power of social networks. And I use my private Facebook page. It's you know, very closed off, but I had one cousin say, Hey, your cousin Jessica's a veterinarian and then tagged her in the comments. And I ended up hiring her and I've been telling candidates, and this could help you if you're also searching for work um, as a lot of us in recruiting have been lately uh, is not to be afraid to consider your personal network as well, whether you're hiring or you're looking for work, because even though you're thinking, well, I know everyone that I'm connected to on Instagram, but you don't know who they're connected to. I have no idea who, you know, what my third cousin that I never met does for work. And so don't be afraid to, you know, not do it every day, but Hey, post about your job search or when you're looking for candidates occasionally. Um, and I, wound up just like very far down the rabbit hole. I think that's the thing that I'm still struggling with is like, when do you walk away and say, oh no, actually I don't need to go find every place this person has ever been. Um, but in this case, I did not have that instinct. And um, like, I wound up finding a colleague who did professional group skydiving and was like, hey, can you get me an invite into this like private blog? And then, uh, I think it was like insecurity too. Like it was not a really easy role to search, to search for. Um, and then found it and it, it worked out. Um, it was a really, really fun time. ABR, always be recruiting wherever you are, <laughs> anywhere you go. Let everybody know about your jobs. Um, I, I think that's one of the things that I'm hearing is um, fortunately, I think everybody on this call has had the luxury of working for teams where you're uh, you're just really in, in, embedded in the process, right? It's really awesome when you really believe in the mission of, of the company that you're working for. So you want to you want to tell everybody. Um, and Emily's talking about bringing it like she wasn't like, hey, you want to buy a duck? You want to buy a duck? It was conversational, right? So you want to meet people where they're at. They're a human. You're a human. Just make them aware. Um, I want to talk about. So we talked about making the hires. What about when you don't make the hire? And what I mean by that is the silver medalist candidate, right? Um, where are you finding success in keeping 
in touch with silver medalists, re-engaging with them? Do you have a process for that? Um, what do you think? Emily, can I start with you? Yeah, um, we actually, so while I was at Netflix, we did have a process for that. We had a CRM that we would leverage to put in reminders to follow up with candidates who we who were what we also called the silver medalist candidate. So we hired someone else. Sometimes it was just we hired an internal person, um, but it was great external candidate. Um, so we would just, I try not to overthink it. We're all busy. So I just set a reminder to follow up with them in a few months. Um, and then I also made sure course we want to give every candidate a great I've noticed a lot a lot of recruiters don't do this is connecting with folks even that you've turned down on LinkedIn so sending them that connection request um, is another way to just keep them in your network and then if you're out there and posting content on LinkedIn they're continuously being reminded of you and what you stand for and what you hire for and how awesome your company is if you're posting about all of that as well so yeah, those are my thoughts. Nothing too fancy. I want to say that this is really emphasizing how important the candidate experience is because if you don't deliver a good experience, it's going to be hard to re-engage these silver medalist candidates. You want them to be excited to hear from you. And what's even great is sometimes you don't get to move forward with somebody, but that's disappointing. But they have somebody that they know and they're like, look, I know I'm not the perfect fit for this job, but I know another person that you should talk to. Um, so I would kind of add that to this. Uh, Sarah, do you have anything to add? Um, we actually will like share Calendly's out and just say, hey, like pick a time and get on our calendar two months from now, three months from now. Um, just a way of just making sure we keep that open. But, you know, plus one to everything Emily just said, it's really, I think if you have like a transparent process and you're saying like, hey, this is what we need. This is why we can't move forward right now. Um, and then when you do finally make that connection and you're like, great, we now took a hiring process that might take a very long time. You can re-engage with someone who you've already kind of pre-qualified and you're like, great, here we go. This entire process could take just a couple of weeks. We yeah. have a question, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say, just be transparent, lead with empathy, be realistic. But yeah, just keep the connection open. Like there's a lot of benefit in holding like with larger leaders or big presence uh, within the team that you support hiring for is have them hold like ask me anything sessions where they can have, you know, a bunch of revisits and, and individuals just want to learn about what projects might have changed for like an hour session live and just they can ask them questions about the projects. I just think anything that you can do to keep re-engagement is huge, but that's nothing new to what everybody else has already mentioned, but I at least wanted to, to call that out. So yeah. 100%. I love that. Um, we've got a question from the chat. What are your thoughts on reaching out to candidates that have been at their current job for less than one year? Oh, in this market? <laughs> yes. Hey, it doesn't hurt. And then in your wording, when you reach out, I try to keep it very friendly to them, not heavy hitting, like, hey, get on the phone with me. I bet you want to work with us. Like, it's just, hey, I don't know if timing is right, but if it is, or you're even just open to a conversation. And um, if they've been there less than a year, then when I think about effective use of time, maybe it would just be a quick chat. So maybe I send them a link to a 15 minute call with Calendly because there's a free version, like no matter what company and budget you have, there's a free version of Calendly. So you can just say, hey, you know, if you, even if you're just looking to chat with the market being a little bit weird right now, feel free to put 15 minutes on my calendar and I'd be, I'd be happy to network with you even if you're not looking to move right now. Um, and I've, I've made hires that way just by saying like, hey, even if even if you're not looking to make a change, let's chat, doesn't hurt to network. Um, a lot of remorse, people are open to doing that. Buyer's remorse happens in relationships, and, automobiles, jobs, and, and maybe that's somebody that's been in their role for less than 12 months or less than six months at some other company, but guess what? maybe you have an offer decline at your own company and they've gone somewhere else and it's been less than 12 months. Check in. Hey, did you make the right decision? A lot of these offers that you spent all this time putting together, that offer is still going to be good when you go back to the hiring manager and say, you know what? This guy made the wrong decision. He really wants to re-engage with us. Hey, absolutely. We offered him XYZ three months ago. That still stands. Bring that guy over here. So person that's been there for less than a year, you're planting a seed. Like you're, you're taking the name, turning the name into a conversation, the conversation eventually into a candidate. 
I, I can't tell you how many individuals, yes, I did come back to my, to Amazon not too long ago, but point is that those that I'm speaking with now will pay off down the road. So there is zero harm in doing that, especially like Emily said, like just open the conversation. Like it doesn't need to be a sell call, like just spark some interest. Like I can't, I can't agree more with you, Emily, like just have the conversation. Yeah. I see my friend, Matt Kirby, who I worked with at Netflix. Matt had an awesome reach out to these harder to engage candidates. Matt, I still remember this calling you out. It was something like the subject line was like coffee chat, anyone? Um, and I think Matt got a really good response rate from that and never posed it with these very passive candidates as like, hey, talk to me. Let's get you in the interview. Just say hey, open to a coffee chat. I thought that was a great approach and seemed to work really well. So. Yeah. And so I saw this, there's another comment in the chat about like getting hiring managers to look beyond the job hopping. One in this market, a lot of them already are like past that. They already understand, um, especially the last two years have been absolutely wild. Um, and I think also when you can say, hey, they've got this thing, whatever it could be that's a ding, that's like a career gap or a job hopping or even sometimes if they're like, oh, their title is this thing. Um, I do this a lot of times with like emailing people from finance who are VPs and I'm like, I've got a director role. And at my company, it's, you know, director, then VP at finance. Sometimes it's VP and the fixed fit. We're saying like, nope, let's let them tell us that. Absolutely. Um, you got to ask the right questions at the right time. You can't be afraid to ask the questions. Really being in recruiting has helped so many other areas of my life because I've better understood the cadence of asking the right questions and, and not answering for other people, um, which is key. Uh, I wanna talk about referral programs. Um, I know everybody on this call has unlimited funds to pay referral bonuses <laughs> to their teams. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, what are some other ways to motivate people on your team to to say, hey, you know, I, I want to bring other people into this organization. How do you manage that? What are some tips and tricks that you have for that? Sarah, I'm I do gonna, just I'm, consistent oh, go reminders. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, Sorry. I'll finish. I've, I'm on my train of thought. Um, I just do consistent reminders. So I join the Slack channels for the teams I'm hiring for. I just pretend and make myself part of their teams. Something that I learned at Amazon, I was like, oh, I'm on Prime Video API now. Like, I don't even know what API is, but I'm gonna be in the group chat. And so occasionally I'll pop in the group Slack and say, you know, hey everyone, don't forget, we've got this awesome referral, referral bonus, super easy, here's a link. Because especially if you're hiring um, these tech talent or whomever, everybody's busy right now. Um, so just having a reminder, because people forget they get stuck in their day to day. Another thing I've started doing is I'll do occasional 15 minute coffee chats for people who would be peers to the person I'm hiring for. So let's say I'm hiring a senior engineer for the iOS apps platform at Reddit. So limited. So having those little chats, um, just 15 minutes of their time. And the way that I get them to say yes, is I'll tell them like, I know that you are working really hard and that you want uh, to add a new member to your team. I want to help you. And so if we just chat for 15 minutes, that's really going to help me bring you that teammate to help shoulder the workload. And they're like, yes, okay. So like, I'm just trying to hire someone awesome for your team. So those are, those are my little tricks. Sarah, sorry, I interrupted you. Oh. Take it away. No worries. Um, I mean, a lot of the same thing. I do a lot of like group sourcing jams where I'll just go to my engineering managers or ERGs. Um, partnering with ERGs has been really, really helpful. And to say, hey, this is how I do my job. Um, you know, quick intros to like Google site searches for, um, especially for hiring designers doing like, here's a site search to find everyone's portfolio. Like they have the, the word portfolio on their website somewhere or in the title. Um, and then just actually like, sit there with them and spend an hour going through, okay, here's how you search and then let them search live with you while you're there to say, oh, okay, actually I would write this kind of thing. Or if there's something where they might not want to share something, like they don't want to reach out, but they want us to reach out for them, anything like that. Um, but just like taking the time and doing that with a group of people and then they get competitive too, where they're like, okay, 
this person over here has just which is all incentive it's all great but like within weekly meetings with the team you would talk about oh john doe has 15 this week next person has 14 13 20. how come you know so and so only has one like not calling them out in that matter but at least like listing the stats like i found a lot of benefit in like driving that internal competition for those sorts of things it really um offers productivity so yeah uh, everything everybody already said 100 on but the competition piece seems to seems to be pretty solid too Next question. Um, what are your thoughts on active referrals and passive referrals? And we might, I don't know if the definition is required. I might kind of, so when I say active referrals, I'm referring to those who have expressed interest and are ready to interview. Um, you've spent time with these connections and nurtured enthusiasm for the company, so on and so forth. And then a passive referral is someone you think the company should engage with to convert into an active candidate, but they're not ready to interview. Um, so what are your thoughts around, around these different populations of people and how you manage those processes? Yeah, I think we'll take any information. Like I will send an email that's just like, Hey, um, you know, just in case you would ever consider coming to the NYT, just in case you'd ever, like I'd open that conversation to passive candidates. I think the way in our system, it's marked as pretty similar. Um, so it's like, or the way that like prospects or referred prospects are, there's no like, this person is ready to go right this second versus this, like, it's just as like, hey, here's a referral. Um, but just establishing that line of conversation and saying- And scalable process. And this is probably something that we could dedicate a whole session to, but as teams are starting to think about this, do you have any insight or tips? Yeah, great call out initially of this could be a session on its own. Like maybe you want to put that on the calendar for a future session. But I, I, I have had the most, so for the way I'm understanding the question is how best you deploy a new strategy or get adoption for a new strategy. And I think the answer can really vary, but things that I've found to be very beneficial are really making it as, like served up as possible for the sourcing team. Like I've worked with groups that have a lot of like great talent intelligence team doing a wealth of like market research and then they're strong sourcers, but there's a disconnect between what they do and how they use that data in their sourcing strategy. So meshing that together, whether it's building like a cool little placemat for them to follow with a bunch of links that they can click on with pre-built Boolean strings or uh, Dennis Dinkovich uh, used to use those um, mind meisters i think they were called where he would do that and build out all these crazy mind maps with links like here's github and here's 12 boolean strings you can click on and it'll take you to the string so my takeaway here is just make it as deployable and useful as possible because if you come to a team saying they need to hire you know 20 front-end engineers and here's some great resources to do it they're all going to get pressed for their numbers and they're going to go back into linkedin and all fish in the same pond again so picking up something that could be deployable for all them to use i, I think is really the key um, at least from getting something new adopted uh, and driving change. So that's my two cents. I just want to let everybody know that's tuning in today. We are recording. The question I want to ask, and I'm actually going to drop a couple of resources into the chat, but um, how do you stay informed about emerging and unique places to find talent? Is there a, is there a secret to that? Like, I feel like there's recruiters in the space. And as soon as something comes down the pipe, they know about it immediately. And I'm just like, how do you, how do you do that? Okay. So I have thoughts on this. I think we're, we've moved into the age of the influencer. And so the way people make decisions is really different than how it was even five years ago. And so all of us as recruiters, sometimes, especially if you've been in this field for a little while, or you're trained by someone who's been in this field, you get into this rut or this zone of I'm going out there to hunt for talent. I'm going to go find them. I'm going to in-mail them. And that may not be as effective as it used to be, especially as the field gets really crowded. There are a lot of, like Mark was sharing, there are a lot of recruiters going after the same people on LinkedIn and response rates continue to drop and all of that. And so I think, I don't know if this is answering the question, but it's also kind of looking at it through not just the old way of how do we um how, and yeah how do i know how how to engage talent rethink what talent engagement is and how people actually make decisions now 
um, and how people are being influenced uh, to make decisions. Where are they getting information? So um, I started to make a lot more hires from LinkedIn. Once I started posting there really regularly about work culture, the cool teams I was hiring for, my values as a woman in tech, um, trying to help underrepresented folks um, get opportunity. Um, also a great thing to do is I live with a teenager, it's my daughter. Um, so I'll ask her like, every once in a while, I'm like, what apps are you using? One, hello, I'm her mom. But two, there are new apps coming up all the time. Um, I brushed off TikTok a few years ago. I could have been a sensation, but I didn't take it seriously. Um, so having said that, people are actually making a lot of purchasing and other, you know, lifestyle decisions on places like TikTok. So, you know, ask a teenager. Um, I think I just kind of went on a rant, yeah. but instead of if thinking about like, where's the newest niche website, think about how can I use the platforms that I'm already on in a more effective and modern way, if that makes sense. Go ahead, Sarah, yeah. sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say to the TikTok point, um, we have a couple of hiring managers that I partner with will like, they have their own TikTok accounts where they just like put out, you know, here's our DevOps channel and they put out stuff. And we've, we have definitely made hires just from like their TikToking. Like we didn't, I don't know if TikTok is a verb. I'm sorry, I might be too old for this <laughs> conversation. Um, but we've, we've made hires there. Um, or just like being, meeting people where they are, like Slack, Discord. I mean, Mark shared that slide that will be emailed out, but, you know, going into a Slack community, seeing how, I will say, always check to see if they have rules for recruiters because a lot of Slack communities do and they will kick you out if you break them um, or really any community. So see that, follow that, but engage, you know, respectfully of their, their communities. Um, but just being like, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, this is what our values are. This is what we are doing. I mean, our mission is huge. We all learn from each other in this sourcing recruiting community. There's tons of good Facebook pages for that. There's, I mean, you could obviously, what we're working on here today, uh, you could obviously find all sorts of different communities to be a part of and just dedicate time to just, okay, here's a new article today. I'm actually going to dedicate 15 minutes to reading it. I just, I, you have to be intentional. Like if you're not trying to adopt or trying to learn something new weekly, daily, like you're probably going to fall behind because the market's changing quickly. Um, and, and real quick on the TikTok news, I did see, and I was trying to find it as you were talking, that more people today, I can't remember the 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 generational cohort, but more people today get their news from TikTok than they do, I think it was like Google News or something like that. I can't remember. And I was trying to find it because I want to give like the actual answer. But point takeaway here, more people get their news from TikTok than other sources, which blows my mind. I didn't know you get news from TikTok. So anyway, that's that's my two cents. Um, th there's a Reddit question that I want to get to, but I just want to add, and I don't, I don't want to make this about me at all, but um, just use stuff in creative ways. I've actually... Where I sit, I have to get a hold of people quite a bit. I'm constantly kind of, in a sense, recruiting, trying to bring people into the webinar program. I've used Venmo. I'll, I'll literally message somebody on Venmo and say, I'm working on XYZ, a penny for your thoughts. And I'll send them a penny. And I've gotten positive responses from people. It literally, that you've ignored my email. You ignored my email. I'm going to send you a penny. Or maybe like if something happens, you know, that they post on LinkedIn and it's, it's, you know, positive or they were lucky, maybe send them a dollar and tell them to buy a scratch off. And Emily, I want to start with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Since I work for Reddit. Yeah. Even though I'm new, this was one of the first questions that I asked and I'm now asking it on a weekly basis. I think this is week six for me. So I've asked at least six times. When are we going to start using Reddit for recruiting here at Reddit? Because I think, and I think some recruiters are, I just maybe haven't connected with them yet but i know that um the developer platform that i just started hiring for is going to be creating their own subreddit and people in the developer community are going to be joining that because they have interest in this project that we're hiring for um so i'll occasionally post in there about open roles but i'm doing something cool tomorrow there's a feature in reddit so essentially zachary like <laughs> No, not that I have learned. Uh, I haven't heard of anything really effective or really very much happening as far as recruiting on Reddit, but I'm sure um, maybe others have something to say about it. But I'm demoing um, something that's still in beta tomorrow in the 
Reddit jobs subreddit. So it has 933,000 people in it. Um, Reddit talk is like club ta- clubhouse or Twitter spaces where it's audio only. Um, so I'm going to go live uh, 1130 Pacific time in that subreddit to talk to folks. The subject is uh, how to find work after you've been laid off and having just been there. So anyway, uh, the point is, I think there are going to be some new ways that we can use Reddit for recruiting because I, my understanding is that Reddit talk will be rolled out eventually to, to everybody, maybe even in the next few months is what I've maybe heard. Um, so that would, that would be cool if you had a subreddit going and you weren't just posting in there on who was interested um, and ended up making hires that way just by demystifying it, destigmatizing it. So I could see Reddit being used successfully, not just to go into existing groups and try and poach candidates and make comments where, you know, sometimes we don't belong because we're recruiters, maybe create a subreddit for valuable like interview prep materials or um, demystifying the interview process or, um, you know, things like that to provide some value to folks and then share that subreddit as you're reaching out to people. Just a thought. That's as much as I know. Oh, I just <laughs> on Reddit. dropped in the chat as well um, for if you want to just search source from Reddit, Aaron Matthew, I think, has like the definitive um, like sourcing recruiting guide. I just dropped that link. Um, it's super, super useful. But, you know, plus one to just engaging with people. Just always try to think, like, what am I adding to this conversation? What am I adding? How am I adding value? Because they're going to remember that more than they're going to say, like, mm-hmm. oh, this person sent me an email. Um, and also, thanks for the, the shout outs to my cat. Sorry, I was trying to get her off of the webinar, but she popped up. Um, I kind of mentioned this with the Venmo thing, but I want to circle back to it. I forgot that I had this question written down. Um, have any of you used any other out of the box methods to contact candidates? So we kind of talked about Reddit. Um, we've talked about different things. And I think the go-tos are email, um, and mail, texting. Um, I, or... I like to do like a double reach out. So not like a full, I'm going to send you an email and an email and they're going to be exactly the same and I'm going to send them at the same second, but like, I will follow someone. So doing some like executive search recently, I'll follow someone on Twitter or Instagram, or I'm professional and the same pretty much everywhere, except discord is the only place that I'm not a a recruiting human. Um, But I will like follow them and then follow up immediately with like a, Hey, loved this bit of content. Here's, I just wanted to make sure you knew about this kind of role. Again, building, those are more, and building a relationship, you're probably not looking like right this second, but that like two pronged, you're a real person, I'm a real person has been really helpful for me. Yeah, oh you God. called out <clears throat> Discord and Slack. <clears throat> I think they're, again, the theme that I've mentioned several times is meeting the candidates where they are. Um, those are dedicated comms channels. I, I, I mean, I, you have to be, like you said yourself, Sarah, very intentional and very careful and follow the rules very well. but. They are good sources to, to, to meet with candidates. So has anybody ever approached you on Discord? You mentioned you're not your recruiting self in. Has anybody ever approached you? Not that it has turned really into anything. It's it's a lot of D&D, and I try to just not be Sarah at all, even. Um, oh. But it's, it's fun. So we're talking about creative ways to reach out to candidates. Is there kind of a rule of thumb where you draw the line? Like what is, is five too many times to reach out? Seven, 10, 32, like when do you stop? Uh, It can be really great to ask people you're reaching out to if they end up connecting with you. Like what was, hey, can I get your take on like what caught your interest? Um, But anyway, the feedback I've gotten from folks is like five starts to feel too aggressive. Amazon, I actually made several hires on my fourth reach out. I would just say as long as it's in good taste, it's not too close together. So uh, sending four messages four days apart is a bad look and it can be off-putting and just again, come off really aggressive and desperate. Um, But if your messages when you're following up are tastefully and kindly worded, like, hey, you know, whatever it is you wanna do in your follow-up email that's nice, I actually got a, a get continuously uh, the best response rate from my follow-ups, not from the initial uh, 
not from the initial reach out. So no, I'm not the 32 message variety. I really nailed it down to, I'll do up to four if needed. And after that, it's the return on investment for time is not there. So I'm curious on other thoughts. And I know it varies by industry as well. And being in tech is its own thing. People on here might know about this. This is a quick tip. When I'm trying to get a hold of somebody and it's not working, this is for email. I'll go into my sent email and I'll forward that message to the person and then I'll change the subject line to Sarah dot 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 bump. And then the message just says, I'm bumping this back to the top of your inbox. That has been a gold mine for me. And I don't know if it's going to work really? for everybody in every industry, but rather than re because a lot of us want to reinvent the wheel on that next follow-up message. It's got to be creative. It's got to be new. Email things are like, oh, you're way overboard for what this should be. <laughs> and then the follow-up is like two lines. It's like, hey, realize you're probably pretty busy. Just wanted to like float this by you. Um, and again, it's usually three inside of like a month and a half. And then, you know, I'll always acknowledge um, whether it's me or someone else on my team, if, if I'm like, hey, it looks like we've tried a bunch. I realize you probably aren't interested, but just in case, wanted to give you the opportunity to say no. Shout out to Mike Chuidian. That guy writes the longest outreach messages. It's like a Shakespearean novel, uh, but it works for him. So uh, I know that can be counterintuitive. Um, we've got a little bit of time left. I want to just ask one more question. What is the minimum signal you're looking for in outreach? How do you balance the tension between reaching out to someone who may be overqualified versus somebody who's potentially, maybe you're denying them an opportunity? Um, how do you, it's kind of a balancing act. I think you need to look at what the determining factors are. Like, are, are, where are you getting those signals? Like, is this signals lack of years of experience or is the signals like, if it's something, a hard stop, like, Maybe they don't have a master's degree that you're looking for. That's a hard stop. But if it comes to years of experience, well, I have a different answer coming from a, a, a very large company with a lot of roles that we try to fill in that. If it is somebody a little bit junior, okay, we could hire them for the next level down. If it's somebody a senior, you can hire for the next level. So it's a little bit different answer from my side. But in terms of like where you're getting the signals and what those signals are, experience gained at some companies can be like dog years. Like one year might equal seven and they could be a staff engineer at your company. So you got to think about where you're getting those signals, but I never shy away unless it's like a real. Yeah, I've read your profile. Maybe this isn't the thing that you're going to jump at, but I wanted to reach out just in case. I did a ton of that when I was hiring security engineers of like, I have literally no idea what you do just in case. And then they're like, oh yeah, that's not me, but that's my friend over here and refer you to the right person. I like that. Yeah, Emily, I, I don't always know. Advice. Yeah, I don't always know what I'm doing in tech hiring. I have a degree in English literature. Um, so as you know, informed as I like to be about who might be a fit for the role, I've actually been surprised. Um, and so I like to reach out with more information rather than less. Uh, as recruiters, we could debate all day on, do you include a link to the job posting? Do you have a long reach out email? Do you have a short one? Um, I do like to include a link to the job posting and I rely on other people to like, I vet them as much as I can, but if you're sourcing a candidate from Instagram or from a really non-traditional place, or even from LinkedIn and they have a bare profile and you don't know, I give them more information upfront so that I don't waste their time before we even get on the phone. Um, and then I tell them like, you know, it looks like this could potentially be a good fit. I definitely don't go for the, this is perfect for you. <laughs> You're going to love it here. I don't know. But like, hey, if this does look like it could potentially be a good fit, um, I'd love to chat with you from here. So I do put a little bit on them to let me know since, especially if I'm hiring for a really unique role. Um, yeah, and I've gotten a great response from that too. So I think it's just being nice. Just be nice. <laughs> I think we are out of time. I could talk to the three of you for the rest of the day, if I'm honest. Um, but thank you for tuning in to Finding Talent in New York. Like we should be covering within this program, please let me know. And if you want to be involved as a speaker or a panelist, definitely reach out. Let's set up a call. Let's talk. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to give you back the rest of your day so that you can catch up on that outreach and those emails and everything else. Cool. Thank you. Have so a great thanks, day. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Bye.